Hey everyone, it's Melissa Parker, pedi pediatric instructor. We're gonna go ahead and go over chapter 28, the child with gastrointestinal conditions. The one week old infant has a stomach capacity of about 30 to 90 mLs. So that's about an ounce to three ounces. And a one month old infant has a stomach capacity of 90 to 150 mLs, and a one-year-old infant has the stomach capacity of 210 to 360 mLs, and a two-year-old has the stomach capacity of approximately 500 mLs, and the adult stomach has a 2,000 to 3,000 mL capacity. So you can see why infants require frequent feedings because their gastro motility is really fast and also their tummy is very tiny, and so doesn't uh, hold the fluid in long enough to sustain them for long periods of time. So let's go through the overview of the gastrointestinal tract. So number one says that it's supposed to transport and metabolize nutrients that are necessary for the cell, for the life of the cell. Um, if you remember in prereqs, we talked about cellular respiration, the use of glucose, and how that's needed in order for the cells to create ATP, which is the energy that they use. So um, it's important for our bodies to be able to distribute the different nutrients to the different tissues that are needed. Um, two is, to ex is that it extends from the mouth to the anus. So the alimental canal, right, it starts at our mouth. The exit is the anus. It's one long tube. Three, nutrients are broken down into absorbable products by enzymes from various digestive tracts. So um, there's different enzymes in the body that help to break down bigger structured molecules. For example, big sugars, right, those get broken down into glucose, big proteins get broken down into amino acids, and fats get broken down into fatty acids, and they're distributed to the different tissues that need them. And if you remember, we can create ATP from some of these. Um, the primary source of ATP is glucose, and then it would be fat. And then in deprivation, our body would use amino acids, but remember those two fuels, fats and amino acids, are dirty fuels. So the GI system difference between children and adults, so we're going to kind of look into that. So the gastrointestinal system, so at birth the uh, resistance of the newborn's intestinal tract to bacterial viral infection is complete, incompletely developed, so they're more susceptible to those types of illnesses. As children grow, they have higher nutrition, uh, nutritional, metabolic, and energy needs because they're going through a lot of different growth. They have to make new tissues, requires more energy for their body to do so. Children with nausea and vomiting dehydrate more quickly than adults do um, that have those symptoms. And the infant's stomach is much smaller to empties rapidly. So newborns produce little saliva until three months of age. So if you have a newborn baby bet between birth to three months and they have excessive drooling, that generally means that there is an underlying condition. You shouldn't see that in a child that young. Swallowing is a reflex for the first three months of life. So it's just something they do in response to suck and swallow. So hepatic efficiency in the newborn is mature, or excuse me, is immature, and sometimes it causes jaundice. So when babies are born, when they're inside mom, they're not really breathing and using their lungs, so they have more red blood cells to help oxygenate their tissues. And then when they're born, um, the they don't need as many red blood cells, and sometimes too during birth there's some tra trauma which causes bruising, and those things can lead to jaundice because the body's uh, normally, when it's mature, the liver and we're older, helps to keep up with the breakdown of the red blood cells. And when red blood cells are broken down, they turn into heme, and um, that heme is then turned into bilirubin as a byproduct. And, it's a yellowish in color and it rises to the skin and that's what gives individuals that yellowish color. And so normally the, the liver helps to clean that bilirubin out, um, but because of the immaturity, it can't do it as well. And so we have to put babies under lights to help to break down that bilirubin into something that can be excreted through the kidneys. So feeding the baby 
um, and hydrating the baby is important, as well as keeping them under the light as much as possible, exposing as much of the skin as you can to the light as well. So the infant's fat absorption is poor because of the decreased pool of bile acid. So they don't really have that capability to store as much bile acid as an adult does. Um, and so if you, they were to eat a lot of fat, sometimes they're, they'll get diarrhea and their uh, stools will be kind of slimy looking because their bodies just can't break it down like an adult's can. So disorders and dysfunctions of the gastrointestinal tract. So laboratory and diagnostic studies, you can find those in your book on page 643. Then there's clinical laboratories. So this would be like your CBC differential. So that could check for anemia, can check for infections, like if the white blood cells are elevated. It can also check for chronic illness if there's bands, because um, bands are immature uh, white blood cells, which means we've used up the more mature soldiers. And so now we're using um, soldiers that don't that aren't trained as well. So erythrocyte sedimentation rate or ESR is indicative of inflammation. Um, and so that's a marker that can uh, indicate whether there's inflammation in the body. Um, it's not really specific to the digestive tract, but it is something that we do monitor. Comprehensive chemistry panel, which can reveal electrolyte and chemical imbalances. Also the liver function test and then stool cultures. X-rays can be a GI series, barium enema, flat plate of the abdomen. So it's just like a normal X-ray. So laboratory and diagnostic studies, we can do endoscopy. So endoscopy allows direct visual visualization of the GI tract through a flexible lighted tube. Um, the upper endoscopy permits visualization and biopsy of the esophagus, the stomach, and also the duodenum. So if people um, are concerned about celiac or the physicians are concerned about celiac, they might do an endoscopy where they'll take biopsies of that duodenum. And that's where they check to see if uh, the cilia inside of the tract is um, atrophying, which is a sign of um, celiac disease, which is a gluten intolerance. Um, we could also do an endoscopy um, for removing foreign objects and also cauterizing bleeding that might be inside the esophagus or the stomach, um, like an ulcer. Um, sometimes we can do endoscopies too to um, visualize the bile in the pancreatic duct. So you've probably heard of like an ERCP before. Um, so sigmoidoscopy, and that is the lower colon where it's inspected, that S-shaped area of the large intestine. And then a colonoscopy can provide visuals, visualization of the entire colon and also the ileocecal valve, which we're gonna learn later. There's a condition that some kids can have where um, there's they get this diverticula, it's close to that ileocecal valve. So symptoms of GI disorder. So some of the signs can be failure to thrive, or you might see it in a chart as FTT. So this is failure to develop according to the established growth parameters. So that's why it's so important that we document growth and weight on um, a patient each checkup so we can see how they're growing. Um, if they're below the third percentile, then they're usually diagnosed with failure to thrive. If, if they sustain below that third percentile, and they have a plateau. Um, so puritis, this is itching um, in the absence of an allergy. So if we have patients and it's not relieved by things like Benadryl, that also can be indicative of liver dysfunction. Um, local signs can be pain, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, rectal bleeding, and uh, hematocyst, I can't ever say this word, hematemesis, which is blood in the vomit. So puritis cause is unknown for patients, but it often results when biochemical abnormalities characterized by a chronically, which is usually greater than six months, elevated serum alkaline phosphate or ALP. Um, and the, the way that we rule out allergies to give Benadryl and see if that relieves any of the symptoms. 
So nursing interventions, they focus on providing adequate nutrition and preventing infection. It can result from malnutrition or depressed immune function. Um, development delays should be investigated. Um, oh, sometimes that can be correlated along with um, poor nutrition as well as the developmental delays. And that's why we monitor weight and growth again. It's so important because usually when uh, they fall below those normals or they start falling off of their normal growth curve, we get concerned that there could be an underlying condition. Skin problems may be related to puritis, irritation from frequent bowel movements or other disorders. Also pain and discomfort need to be addressed. You should always um, try to rule out what the pain is that that the patient is complaining about in relation to the GI tract. Okay, so now we're going to talk about congenital, congenital disorders. Um, so the one we're going to talk about right now is called esophageal atresia. Sometimes um, there's called tracheoesophageal fistula or TEF. Um, so this can be found on page 643 and there's also a figure on page 644, figure 28-2 that you can refer to. Um, so the tracheoesophageal fistula is caused by the failure of the tissues of the GI tract to separate properly during prenatal life. Um, so most of the time we can diagnose this even when baby is in utero. Um, and that is because um, the fetus usually swallows some of the amniotic fluid. But because there's a blind pouch there, the baby doesn't swallow the fluid. Um, and the fluid starts to back up and it leads to polyhydramnios. Um, and sometimes it's also related to maternal diabetes or fetal infection um, or multiple gestations. So um, there's a lot of uh, contributing factors that can cause this. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about today because there's four different types is one where the upper and the lower esophageal or the esophagus um, from the stomach end in a blind pouch. So if you were looking, if we're talking about this one right here, this is the one we're talking about right here. Then there's another one where the upper esophagus ends in a blind pouch, and then the lower esophagus um, from the stomach connects to the trachea. So if we were talking about this one right here, that's this right here. So you can see that this is attached to the esophagus right here. Then the other one is the upper esophagus where it's attached to the trachea. And it's also, um, the lower esophagus is also attached to the trachea. So if you look, the upper part of the esophagus, which is right here, is attached to the trachea. And then the lower part, which is attached to the stomach, is, is attached to the trachea too. So if we're talking about that one, that's this one right here. Then the upper esophagus connects to the trachea and then the lower esophagus from the stomach ends in a blind pouch. So this one right here would be this one right here. Um, so if we have conditions where the esophagus is attaching to the trachea, right? these babies can have breathing difficulty. So one of the things that we check for with babies is we monitor their first feeding to see are they choking and are they turning blue during the feedings or when they eat, like this one right here, they eat, they eat, they eat, this little pouch keeps filling, filling, filling until the baby throws up. And so they're not keeping any of their foods down and they're becoming very dehydrated. They're not wetting very many diapers. We start to get concerned that maybe there's an underlying issue. Oops. So nursing care for TEF. So the first thing we want to do is prevent pneumonia, choking, and apnea in the newborn. As you can imagine, in some of those conditions that I showed you in the previous slide, when they swallow the formula, um, it can go into their lungs, and so they can get aspiration pneumonia. So we're going to assess the newborn during the first feedings for signs and symptoms of tracheoesophageal fistula. That's essential. Um, so feeding usually is with clear water or colostrum to minimize the seriousness of aspiration. Uh, once diagnosed, surgical repair is essential for the baby to survive. 
Um, the next congenital anomaly we're going to talk about is an imperforated anus. So the lower GI and anus arise from two different types of tissue during the fetal development. And once the two meet, perforation occurs, allowing for a passageway. So when perforation does not take place, the lower end of the GI tract and the anus end in a blind pouch. So there's four types ranging from stenosis, where there's just narrowing, to complete separation or failure of the anus to form. Um, so you can see right here, um, this baby doesn't have an opening at all. So it's one of our newborn assessments for these babies. Um, usually uh, take a rectal temp to just check for, uh, make sure that it is patent. We also monitor for meconium, make sure meconium passes prior to discharge. Um, so manifestations would be failure to pass meconium in the first 24 hours. Um, that has to be reported. An infant should not be discharged home until meconium stool has been passed. Uh, treatment, so once established, the infant is then placed in PO and prepared for surgery. So anytime we have a baby in PO, we have to provide IV hydration to the baby, especially for these kiddos. Um, initial surgical procedure may be a colostomy, just depends on the severity of the anomaly. And then subsequent surgeries will reestablish patency of the anal canal. Um, the next uh, congenital anomaly we're going to talk about is the pyloric stenosis. So this is an obstruction of the lower end of the stomach that causes overgrowth of the circular muscles in the pylorus or, in, or spasms of that sphincter. So we remember the pyloric sphincter in the um, abdomen. We learned about that in prereqs. So right here you can see there's an abnormal thickening of that pyloric sphincter. Um, so this is commonly classified as a congenital anomaly. So symptoms usually do not appear until the infant is two to three weeks old. So these babies could be discharged home and um, the doctors, the nurses, and the family could be unaware that this um, is a condition the baby has. This is the most common surgical condition of the GI tract in infancy and the incidence is higher in boys than in girls. And one of the telltale signs is projectile vomiting. Um, and the outstanding symptom from force or pressure being exerted on the pylorus. So the stomach's trying to squeeze to empty the bolus of food, um, but because there's such a narrowing from that pyloric stenosis, as the stomach clamps down, the force pushes the uh, bolus back up and the baby ends up having this projectile vomiting. Um, so one of the things that you wanna look for with this is what does the vomit look like? So the vomitus contains mucus and then ingested milk. Um, the infant is constantly hungry and will eat again immediately after vomiting. So uh, they don't really feel nauseous. Um, they just happen to vomit because of that narrowing and the force of the contractions of the stomach. And then once they throw up, they wanna eat again. So uh, dehydration obviously is an issue. And then if you were to palpate the abdomen, you could feel an olive shaped mass um, that's felt in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. As we go through these congenital anomalies or these conditions, it's really important for you to pay attention to what is very specific to each disease. So with the um, tracheoesophageal fistula, right, that polyhydramnios, the um, monitoring for choking and um, pneumonia and monitoring the first feeding. Um, and also the pyloric stenosis is that forceful projectile vomiting. So celiac disease, this is known as a gluten enteropathy or sprue. It's the leading malabsorption problem in children, and it's thought to be caused by inherited disposition with environmental triggers. So symptoms are not evident until six months to two years of age when food that contains glutens are introduced into the body. Um, and then the foods that we are concerned with, of course, are anything that contains gluten, which would be wheat, barley, uh, oats, and rye. Now, oats by themselves generally do not contain gluten. The issue with oats is that they are processed on machinery that does process gluten. And so these 
um, patients are very sensitive to that and they can have reactions. Um, so with celiac disease, repeated exposure to gluten damages the villi of the intestines resulting in malabsorption. So if you remember in prereqs, we talked about that the little villi that live on the folds of the intestine are there to increase the surface area to allow for maximum absorption. Well, the gluten is killing the villi, and so there's less surface area. And then in addition to that, the mucosa is unable to absorb food properly. So the characteristic profile is abdominal distension, and then they have atrophy of the buttocks. So you can see right here, there's no um, buttocks, and they have this protruding abdomen right here. Um, they look like the same children that you would see in a third world country that are malnourished. Um, so celiac disease, the National Institute of Health classified this disease in four different ways. So you have the classic symptom, which is you have the atrophy of the villi in the small intestine, you have malabsorption issues, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Then you have atypical. So this is not how people normally present, which is why it's called atypical. Um, so you have the duodenum, which has mild GI symptoms. So manifests as anemia, fatigue, and then they might have peripheral nerve problems. Then there's silence. So silent is where atrophy of the intestines is found during endoscopy or biopsy or a positive blood test. Um, so they don't really have a whole lot of symptoms. And then there's latent. So latent may not have atrophy, but manifests as a wheat sensitivity by a reoccurring rash. Um, with celiac disease, um, the infant will present with failure to thrive. They're very irritable. Their stools are large, bulky, and frothy. And that's because they're the inability to um, digest and process and absorb food. Diagnosis is confirmed by a serum immunoglobulin A and a small bowel biopsy. Um, so treatment is a lifelong diet restricted of wheat, barley, oats, and rice. So remember, oats by themselves do not have gluten. There's actually some oats that people can eat, but they have to say they're gluten-free, which means they have not been processed on the same machinery as other foods that contain gluten. So detailed parent teaching is essential. Um, they're going to be they're going to need to be referred to a dietitian so they can learn about the foods because um, gluten can be hidden in other foods that people are unaware of, like malt or soy sauce. And so detailed education is really important. Um, a professional nutrition or dietitian can aid in identifying foods that are that have gluten. Um, so the next disease is Hirschsprung disease, and this is an aganglionic megacolon. So megacolon because the, um, the colon becomes very enlarged. So you can see right here the colon is very large, and that's because this part of the intestine is uh, continuously contracted and clamped down. And that's because there's an absence of the ganglionic innervation of the muscle of that segment of the bowel. And so it's usually in the lower po portion of the sigmoid colon where this occurs. And there's lack of normal peristalsis and that results in constipation. So the stool is backing up this way in the intestine because it cannot move this way due to this narrowing right here. Um, so stools are ribbon-like due to the feces passing. So this is a telltale sign right here, that ribbon-like stool um, that passes through the narrow segment of the colon. So a portion of the bowel nearest the obstruction dilates, right? So this, is, this part of the bowel is what's nearest to the obstruction here, so it's dilating, um, causing abdominal distension. And it's seen more often in boys and in children that have Down syndrome. So it can be acute, which it comes on suddenly, or it can be a chronic condition as well. Um, so newborns, um, if they have this, they might have the failure to pass the meconium 
uh, stools within 24 to 48 hours. So we've already talked about two different conditions where that could be problematic. We have the imperforated anus, and now we're talking about Hirschsprung's too. So both of those can have failure to pass the meconium. So you, if you have a test question and that's the only option, you might want to be looking to for a second clue as to what which one you're dealing with. Um, so infants have constipation, that ribbon-like stool, abdominal distension, anorexia, vomiting, and failure to thrive. So young children are usually seen in the clinic after parents have tried over-the-counter laxatives to treat the constipation. Um, so Hirschsprung's aganglionic megacolon. So um, the diagnostic testing would be a barium enema a rectal biopsy, and then an anorectal mammonometry. So the rectal biopsy, um, they're checking to see if the nerves, um, if they have that ganglionic nerve. If they don't, then they can be diagnosed as um, having Hirschsprung. The anorectal mammonometry uh, checks the contraction of the bowel inside the colon. Um, so enterocolitis, this is inflammation of the small bowel and the colon, and it's a very serious condition. So kids that have Hirschsprungs are susceptible to this. Um, you're gonna wanna know what the signs and symptoms are for this, okay? Um, babies can have fever, okay? Um, and they're gonna have explosive stools. And the reason they're having explosive stools is because they're severely constipated um, and the liquid stool is seeping around the hard stool and it's being pushed out. And then they're going to have um, a depletion of strength. Um, if untreated, other signs of intestinal obstruction and shock can be seen. Um, so treatment, surgery to remove the impaired part of the colon and anastomosis of the intestine is performed. Um, so sometimes they have to remove part of the colon and they'll have a temporary ostomy and then they'll reattach later. In newborns, a colostomy may be needed until 12 to 18 months of age when more extensive repair can be performed. They're just too tiny when they're younger to do a complete repair. So nursing care is dependent upon the age of the child. So in a newborn detection is the high priority. As a child grows, Careful attention to the history of constipation and diarrhea is important. This may not be caught early on. Uh, kids can have issues for a longer period of time. Um, sometimes they just think it's regular uh, constipation, so we have to be monitoring really closely. The other signs are undernutrition. Um, they don't feel hungry because they're constantly constipated. They have abdominal distension, and then they have poor feeding. So those would be suspect for Hirschsprungs, not just the poor feeding, but the other symptoms as well. So enema. So due to the increased size of the mucous membrane surface area, an increased absorption of the fluid can be anticipated. So therefore, normal saline should be used to prevent water intoxication. So we never give, you never give tap water enemas ever to kids because they're at risk for water intoxication because their mucous membranes are very permeable. Um, so always use normal saline. Parents should check with the pediatrician to see how much saline should be administered with each enema. Um, so think about why are we concerned with how much fluid we're putting into a baby for an enema. Um, you have to worry about electrolyte imbalances, right? Every time um, we're putting water in there and causing diarrhea, there's a, a loss of electrolytes. And so we can cause the baby um, to lose electrolytes and we're also causing the baby to become more acidic as we um, flush the bowel out of the basic content that's in there. So if you remove some of that base, it makes the baby more acidic. And so they're going to have metabolic acidosis. 
So interception. So this is where there's a slipping of one part of the intestine into another part of the intestine. Um, I liken this to like a telescope that a pirate uses, right? So the the intestines slip over the top of each other just like the telescope would. It's often seen at the ileocecal valve. So remember we, I talked about that earlier um, when we were talking about doing uh, colonoscopies. Um, and so this is in that area where that occurs. Uh, the mesentery, so the mesentery is that mesh that kind of holds our intestines into place. It'll have a double fan-shaped fold of the peritoneum that covers most of the intestine and it's filled with blood vessels and nerves and it's also being pulled along with it. So a lot of times you palpate, there's a lot of pain for these uh, babies and then um, they get uh, inflammation in there so their tummy feels kind of tight. Edema occurs, so there's going to be swelling, and then at first the intestinal obstruction occurs, but then strangulation of the bowel occurs as peristalsis occurs. So you have that slipping on of the intestines where they're telescoping on each other, but then peristalsis is induced, and so that's where bowel obstruction starts to happen when the bowel starts clamping down during peristalsis. The affected portion can burst, and that can lead to peritonitis. Um, so you can see right here how it's telescoped on top of each other and then here the doctor is pulling that intestine part out. This is an emergency situation. It needs to be handled right away um, if this is being suspected. Um, so generally it occurs in boys between three months to six years. So you can imagine a three month old is not going to be able, they're going to tell you to tell you that they're in pain. They're going to be crying, drawing their legs up to their chest, very irritable. Um, so frequency decreases after 36 months. Um, they can have spontaneous reduction, meaning that sometimes on their own, the bowel will slip back off of each other. Sometimes they'll do an, a barium enema to try to force the intestines off of each other. Um, even though that can happen, doctors generally do not wait because it is an emergency situation. So the onset is usually sudden. They may have a fever, okay? You wouldn't think that because it's not like we're talking about an infection, but they can get peritonitis from this. So they'll start having a fever. And as it progresses, a child may show signs of shock and sweating, a weak pulse, shallow grunting respirations, and the abdomen is very rigid. So infants have severe pain in their abdomen. They have loud cries, straining efforts. So they're feeling like they need to go to the bathroom and they're bearing down, but they can't go. That could mimic constipation. So you have to look at all the other symptoms that come with it. They're gonna be kicking and drawing their legs up toward the ab abdomen. Also when the child vomits. So vomit can tell us a lot about what's going on with the patient as well, which is why we need to observe it even though it's, it's gross, right? But we still need to look at it. It's gonna be green or greenish, yellowish fluid. And that's because it's bilious. Um, bowel movements will diminish. There'll be a little flat as past. And that's because um, of the obstruction. Blood and mucus with no feces. Okay, so blood and mucus, no feces. Okay, are common about 12 hours after the onset of the obstruction and they have a current jelly stool. So it kind of looks like um, this pinkish, orangish jelly, that like the type of jelly you would put on your bread. It's that kind of a consistency. There's no stool in it. And that's because it's blood mixed with this. So treatment of interception. So this condition is an emergency situation. So diagnosis is, a, is determined by the history and the physical findings. You may feel a sausage shaped mass in the right upper abdomen and the barium enema is treatment of choice with surgery if the reduction does not occur. So now we have Meckel's diverticulum. So it usually occurs near the ileocecal valve. That's at a, so her, that can happen with uh, interception and now Meckel's diverticulum, uh, di diverticulum can also happen there too. And it may be connected to the umbilicus by a cord. So you have a fistula that may also form and there's a sac that is subject to inflammation. So it's the most common congenital malformation of the GI tract and again, it's seen more often in boys. Um, so here's a picture of it. 
here you can see it on this diagram here and this is what it looks like in real life so if you remember diverticulum is a little pouch that's kind of made inside of the intestine part of the issue is that food could get trapped in there and then that can lead um, to uh, infection so symptoms can occur at any age, but typically appear by two years of age. It's painless bleeding from the rectum. So they're not having any pain. Bright red or dark red blood is more usual than tarry stools. And that's because it's happening in the intestines. Um, abdominal pain may or may not be present. So um, uh, painless bleeding from the rectum, but they still can have some abdominal pain but they may not have pain. Uh, so diagnostic, the barium enema or the radionucleotide sphincterography are used in diagnosing, so x-ray films are not helpful. You have to use uh, the barium enema in order to be able to see the abnormality on uh, x-ray. Um, so treatment is surgical removal of the diverticulum. So nursing care is the same for any patient that's undergone any type of an abdominal treatment. Um, hernias. So there's different types of hernias babies can have. They can have inguinal or umbilical. This baby right here has an umbilical hernia. So inguinal is a protrusion of part of the abdominal content through the inguinal canal that's in the groin. So as the baby cries, you might see some bulging in the groin area. The umbilical is a protrusion of the portion of the intestine through the umbilical cord ring. Um, and it appears as a soft swelling covered by skin, which protrudes when the baby strains. Um, so for hernias, it may be present at birth, which would be congenital or it can be acquired. Um, is reducible if it can be put back into place by gentle pressure. So if it pokes out, you're able to palpate it back down into place, then that's called reducible. If it cannot be put back into place, it's irreducible or incarcerated. It means it's stuck and it's trapped in there. And the issue with that is it can lead to strangulation. So strangulated hernia is when the intestine becomes caught in the passage and the blood supply is becoming diminished. And so without blood, there's not any nutrients or oxygen going to that tissue. It begins to die. So the chi child may vomit and have severe abdominal pain it's an emergency surgery for this. It's indicated in this type of a situation. And in most cases, same day surgery can be performed for this. So disorders of motility, um, gastroenteritis. Um, so it involves inflammation of the stomach and intestines. So colitis involves an inflammation of the colon. Enterocolitis involves the inflammation of the colon and small intestines. Most common non-infectious cause of diarrhea. Um, and it can be due to food intolerance, overfeeding, improper formula preparation, ingestion of high amounts of sorbitol. A priority problem in diarrhea is fluid and electrolyte imbalance, right? Remember, kids can dehydrate very, very quickly. So we want to make sure we address that as well. And then also failure to thrive can become a problem as well. So treatment is focused on identifying and eradicating the cause. So we looked at the last slide. You can see there's many different things that can contribute to it contribute to the gastroenteritis. So we have to start ruling things out. A lot of times they'll do a food journal. They'll do an emission diet where you take certain foods out and then you add them in slowly. And then you document when there's changes so you can identify what the contributing cause is or what food is causing it. So priority goal of care is restoring the fluid and electrolyte balance. Accurate intake and output, weighing the diapers, observing for dehydration. Um, so turgor, diapers, tears, wet mucous membrane, those are things we're looking for with uh, dehydration. Or it can be overhydration too. A lot of these kiddos we have to put on IV fluids and so we have to be monitoring for that as well. And keeping the infant child um, warm is, a, is gonna be um, important as well. So review with parents proper hand hygiene techniques, safe food handling and storage, principles of cleanliness and infection prevention. So, um, you know, that's why one of the reasons why we don't feed babies out of the baby food jar and then save whatever they don't eat and put it back in the fridge. It can lead to diarrhea. 
um, because we have bacteria in our mouth or if you don't make the formula properly that can lead to diarrhea as well so getting a history from the family learning what um, what they're feeding the baby how they're doing it so um, you being a, a great historian is going to be huge in identifying the cause for the gas um, so clarifying food labels when you have people that have food allergies or food intolerances um, based on what the packaging says they may not identify it as one of the contributing causes to their allergies so children may have food allergies so teach parents the following so if the ingredient says it has a binder then that means it can contain egg if it says it has a bulking agent that means it can have soy if it has casein, that means it has cow's milk. Coagulant means it could have egg, emulsifier, egg, protein extender, that would be soy as well. So vomiting, this results from sudden contraction of the diaphragm and muscles of the stomach. Uh, persistent vomiting requires investigation because it results in dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. A uh, continuous loss of hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride from the stomach can cause alkalosis. It can result in death and even left untreated. So if you think about it right, when we vomit, our stomach has, is a very acidic environment. So as we're vomiting, we're throwing up that acid. We're getting rid of the acid. So when that happens, that actually increases our pH and it makes us more alkaline. So then we're dealing with metabolic al um, alkalosis. So we have to um, monitor dehydration very closely. There could be multiple causes for vomiting and proper feeding technique. Um, so propping bottles, not holding the baby up in a, in a sitting position, not keeping them propped up after feeding. Systemic illness such as increased intracranial pressure or infection. And then a child at risk for aspiration pneumonia when they're vomiting. So we have to monitor them very closely. If a child is ever laying down in the hospital and they start to vomit, you do not want to pick them up. If you pick them up, they're going to aspirate. You just want to turn them over to their side. It is messy, but it's the safest way to maintain their airway. So nursing care, carefully feed and burp the infant. Place the infant on the side after feeding to prevent aspiration if vomiting occurs. When an older child vomits, turn their head to one side and offer the emesis basin. IV fluids may be ordered. Slowly introduce foods to allow the stomach to rest. So usually when we have babies or pediatric patients that are sick, we always start with clear liquids, then full liquids, then soft, and then brat depending on uh, if they have diarrhea or not and then also uh, from there we can um, move to normal food so we kind of go in those stages um, so documentation uh, some of the things you want to document is the time that the baby vomited the amount the color the consistency the force right like Hirschsprung's or not Hirschsprung's sorry um, pyloric stenosis right that projectile vomiting, the frequency and whether the vomiting was preceded by nausea or feedings. Um, administration of an anti-medic agent should also be documented, including the time given and if the uh, vomiting did subside after we used the medication. Um, so gastroesophageal reflex. So this is the lower esophageal sphincter. It's relaxed or not competent, and that allows the stomach content to regurgitate into the esophagus. It's associated with neuromuscular delays such as Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. Um, it's often seen also in premature infants. Uh, symptoms often decrease once a child is able to stand upright and eat more solid foods. So uh, babies that are drinking formula, it's liquid and it's very thin. So um, if that sphincter is relaxed, it, they're going to spit up a lot. Um, so as they start eating more solid foods, it's thicker and so it doesn't come up through that sphincter um, as much. And then also the sphincter may become stronger after a period of time. And then when they're able to sit up, you know, if we they feed them and we lay them down, the pressure of the abdomen um, and the muscles push on the stomach and that causes them to vomit. So symptoms for gastroesophageal reflux. Vomiting, weight loss, failure to thrive, infant and 
the infant may be fussy and hungry. Respiratory problems can occur when vomit stimulates closure of the epiglottis and the infant presents with apnea. So the irritation causes the epiglottis to swell or close and then the baby can start choking. So those are things you have to monitor for with reflex. Um, so usually history, um, we want to collect um, when the vomiting started, the type of formula the baby's using, because maybe they're intolerant to it, the type of vomit. Um, is it newly digested milk? Is it um, rotten, stinky milk? Is it bilious? Uh, feeding techniques. How often are they burping the baby? How often are they feeding the baby? How much are they feeding the baby? Uh, the infant's eating in general. And then the test can include a barium swallow, esophageal sphincter pressure, and the pH monitoring, um, which is the most diagnostic. So nursing care, you want to carefully burp the baby when feeding. You want to prevent overfeeding, so smaller meals more frequently. Proper position, keeping them upright, and then you're going to maintain in an upright position after feeding for at least 30 minutes after uh, the feed. Uh, feedings can be thickened with cereal. Now, this is only with a uh, prescription from the doctor. We don't ever tell parents to add cereal into their milk without talking to the doctor first. So the cereal works to thicken up the milk, which makes it uh, more viscous and then uh, less likely to fit through that little uh, esophageal sphincter that's kind of relaxed. Um, so after being fed, infants should be placed upright, positioned, or propped. Sitting upright in an infant seat is not recommended. Um, babies have died being placed in the infant seat to sleep because it's uh, not in the base. When the infant seats are uh, snapped into the base, they're kept at a proper angle, which keeps their head alignment um, in the right place. But when you take the infant seat out and put it on the floor, um, it can cause their head to fall forward and cut off their airway. So you want to make sure that you um, don't leave babies in the infant seat to sleep. Um, administer medications to relax the pyloric sphincter. So that's the sphincter that's at the bottom, right? So that will allow the tummy to empty more frequently, which means that uh, the tummy won't fill up to the point where um, the, the food is coming back up through the esophageal sphincter. So a general guide to determine the optimal intake to prevent gastric distension is to feed the infant no more than its age in months plus three. So you do that and then you do that every three to four hours. So example, a three month old infant should be fed a maximum of six ounces in one feeding. Um, so medications that relax the pyloric sphincter and promote stomach emptying may be used like a histamine 2 receptor antagonist like Zantac or Pepsid, or we can use a proton pump inhibitor such as Prilosec. Um, usually doctors tend to do uh, the Zantac first. So diarrhea. Um, in an infant, it's a sudden increase in stools from the infant's normal pattern with a fluid consistency and a color that is green or contains mucus or blood. So acute sudden diarrhea most often caused by inflammation or infection or response to medication, food, or poisoning. You know, so if we have babies on antibiotics, it's not uncommon for them to have diarrhea. So we have to get a good history, try to identify the cause of the diarrhea. Chronic diarrhea that lasts more than two weeks and may indicate malabsorption problems, long-term inflammatory disease, or allergic response. Uh, infectious diarrhea is caused by viral, bacterial, or parasitic infection, um, and that usually involves gastroenteritis. Symptoms of diarrhea, so the stools are watery and explosive. They may be yellowish green. Um, infants might be listless. They might refuse to eat. There might be weight loss. The temperature may be elevated um, and possible vomiting. So sometimes the temperature can be elevated even if there's not an infection because when we have diarrhea or vomiting, we're getting rid of water. Water helps to cool our body off. So they're dehydrated. Their temperature might be slightly elevated. Dehydration is evidence um, but of or how you can identify dehydration would be by the sunken eyes. 
of and fontanelle for an infant baby, right? We're monitoring that soft spot. If it's indented, right, then that could be a sign of dehydration. We're looking for dry skin, tongue, mucous membranes, and then less frequent urination. All of those can be contributed to dehydration. In severe cases, ex since excessive loss of bicarbonate from the GI tract can result in acidosis. Um, so one of the ways we provide nursing care for patients is to provide rest. So intestines can be rested by reducing the intake of solid food. So might provide them with clear liquids first. Um, anytime we have a baby that's vomiting or has diarrhea, we always want to try oral restorative therapy first, like Pedialyte or Infolyte. Um, you can do it in a liquid or you can provide it like in a popsicle form. Um, and you want to give it gradually to, and then you can slowly introduce soft and bland diets later. So clear fluids that can be like a fruit juice that doesn't have any pulp, um, gelatin and carbonated drinks that have low electrolyte content, um, those should be um, avoided. Um, carbonated drinks, you want them to go flat before you give them to uh, kids, but high sugar content like fruit juice or things that have high sugar can actually make diarrhea worse because the higher the sugar content, you're going to have that osmotic shift of fluid and um, that can contribute more to dehydration. Um, so caffeinated beverages we want to avoid as well because um, that is a diuretic caffeine and so that's going to make the dehydration worse. Uh, chicken broth that is very high in sodium and for kids it's not advised to provide that um, as clear liquid. Um, brat diet is not nutritionally sound enough to support growth and development so we wouldn't want them to be that on long to be on that diet for long periods of time but during the um, first part of the illness um, if it's related to illness we would we could recommend a brat diet um, and then that should be just for a couple days, and then we should be able to put them back on their regular uh, food. So constipation. This is a difficult or infrequent defecation with a passage of hard, dry fecal matter. So it may be, there may be periods of diarrhea or incapricis. Um, so this is a constipation with fecal soiling. And again, that's related to that liquid stool that seeps around the hardened stool that's um, stuck inside the bowel. Um, it may be a symptom or other disorders, um, or it can be a symptom of other disorders like Hirschsprung's. Um, so things that we want to consider as nurses is the patient's diet, what's their culture, um, and the social and psychological um, issues that might be going on, and then familial pattern, patterns may also influence the occurrence of constipation. So daily use of a laxative or enema, enema should be discouraged. We want to try diet, water, exercise first. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then we might need to consider something different, maybe like a stool softener. Um, so fewer than seven bowel movements in a two-week period is characterized as constipation. You want to ask caregivers to define constipation. You want to evaluate dietary and bowel habits. So some infants develop constipation due to high iron content that's in the formula. Um, so you want to note the frequency of the stool, the color, and the consistency of the stool. You want to document any medications the child's taking. Dietary modifications can include increasing refuges in the diet, so foods that are high in fiber. That would include whole grains, breads, and cereals, raw vegetables and fruit, bran, and popcorn for older children. We wouldn't recommend that for younger children because it is a choking hazard. And then also stool softeners can be prescribed. Um, we try to stay away from laxatives because then the bowel can become dependent on it. Um, so things like Miralax or Colace. So fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So babies' bodies makeup is very different than that of an adult's. You guys have this figure on 28.9. I think it's on page 655. So if you look at an adult, right, 70% of their fluid is intracellular, whereas 30% is extracellular. So I'm comparing... Um, the female patient right now. 
Um, but for younger children, 62% is intracellular and 38% is extracellular. Um, and so the way we treat dehydration is very different because of that. Um, so in children that are two years of age, the surface area in, um, is important because more water is lost through the skin than through the kidneys. And remember, uh, skin of a, of a child is uh, thinner, and so they can lose fluid um, uh, more quickly. Also, metabolic rate and heat production are also two to three times greater in infants per kilogram of body weight. They produce more waste products, which must be diluted to be excreted, stimulated, stimulates respiration. So that means that they're further losing water through evapor evaporation in their lungs. And then a greater percentage of body water in children under two years is contained in that extracellular compartment. So fluid turnover is rapid and dehydration occurs more quickly in infants than in adults. Um, a sick infant does not adapt as readily to shift in the intake and the output, so less able to concentrate urine and require more water than adults' kidneys to excrete the given amount of solute. So if you remember, infants cannot concentrate their urine, so they're more likely to become dehydrated. And so electrolyte balance depends on the fluid balance and cardiovascular, renal, adrenal, pituitary, parathyroid, and pulmonary regulatory mechanisms. Um, so um, all of those can contribute to dehydration. Uh, so signs of dehydration may not be evident until the fluid loss reaches 4%, and severe dehydration may not be evident until the fluid loss is about 10%. So you have to be monitoring that very carefully. Um, you want to treat with oral fluids first, and then if that fails, then we can try parenteral fluids. But we always want to do lesser of the invasive with kids. Um, starting an IV is very traumatic for them. So we wanna to try to encourage oral intake first. Um, so dehydration, so this causes fluid and electrolyte disturbances. Um, evaluation of the type and severity include clinical observation and chemical analysis of the blood. So you need to be monitoring those labs very carefully, especially the chem panels, which show us the electrolytes. There's different types of dehydration and they're classified according to the level of the serum sodium, which depends on the relative loss of water and electrolytes. You guys should know what the difference is between each um, dehydration. So isotonic would mean that they have equal amounts of um, electrolytes and water lost. And the hypotonic dehydration means that there's more electrolytes than fluids that have been lost. And then hypertonic dehydration means more fluid than electrolytes have been lost. So each form of dehydration is associated with different relative losses uh, from the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. So each requires specific modifications and treatment. So isotonic, we're gonna use like a normal saline solution, but we're gonna treat hypotonic and hypertonic with a different type of solution. Um, so dehydration, so maintenance fluid therapy is used to replace the normal water and electrolyte losses. So if you and I were put in PO for a procedure, they're just giving us enough fluid to cover what we would normally be drinking on our own. Deficient therapy restores the pre-existing body fluid and electrolyte deficiencies. So this is us, we've been vomiting all night, we have diarrhea all night, we're already dehydrated. So that means that we need to make up what we've lost and then also maintain what we would need during that time. Um, so shock is the greatest threat to life in isotonic dehydration. And children with hypotonic dehydration are at risk for water intoxication. That's why it's so important that we identify the type of dehydration the patient has and make sure they're getting the proper um, IV solution to replace their um, their losses. In kids, we usually use D5 half normal saline. Um, it's not normal saline by itself. The older the child may be, but those younger children are probably going to be D5 half. Um, potassium is lost in almost all degrees of dehydration and is replaced only after the normal urinary excretion is confirmed. So anytime we have a baby that's coming that has GI symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, 
we're still going to have them on an IV, but we're just not going to add the potassium because to the IV solution until we see that the baby can void. Um, we want to make sure their kidneys are functioning and potassium can be hard on the kidneys if they're um, compromised. So overhydration. So uh, anascara is a severe generalized edema. Um, it's causes from low protein levels, which disturb the osmotic cellular pressure. So if you remember, protein plays a huge part in keeping the fluids from seeping into the interstitial spaces of the body. Um, specifically albumin, which is why when our albumin drops low, people start having edema and ascites because the fluid leaks from where it's supposed to be into those interstitial spaces. So the flow of blood out of the intestinal compartments depends on adequate circulation of blood and lymph, so manifestations of edema, excessive fluid in the interstitial spaces. So interstitial fluid is similar to the plasma, but contains little protein. Um, so any factors causing sodium uh, retention can cause edema. So the body is going to receive more fluid than it can excrete. Um, so a lot of times we see this in third world countries where um, mom was breastfeeding a baby solely. And so they were getting adequate protein during that time, but then mom becomes pregnant, has to nurse another baby, and so baby is quickly weaned. And then because they live in a poor area, they don't have adequate protein, so they're eating diets that are like primarily cornmeal or very low in protein. And so their body's not used to that because the baby wasn't weaned, and then they have these shifts in their fluids um, in the cardina. So overhydration, so treatment. So this is usually related to IV therapy um, where we provide too much um, fluid to a baby. Um, so we have to monitor it very, very closely. Um, it, there's actually a calculation for it um, and you need to know when you get out on the floor, but not for this test, what that calculation is um, to make sure that the doctor is ordering the proper amount of fluid. Um, there's a calculation for maintenance, which means just replacing what normally would need to be replaced. And then there's also one for deficit. So it's dependent upon the type of electrolyte imbalance the child has. And if the child has a hypertonic type of dehydration, we would not want to give tomato juice. Um, it shouldn't be offered. Um, because tomato juice has a high sodium content and the baby already has retaining too much sodium. If the child has hypotonic type of dehydration, plain water should not be given because then they're going to get water intoxication. So a baby that has um, hypotonic dehydration, they have more sodium loss. So it's less than 135, their sodium level. And then the fluid shifts into the cells. And the baby might start complaining of muscle cramps, a rapid pulse, hypotension, weakness, and then also can lead to seizure. For hypertonic dehydration, sodium loss is less than the water. So it's more than 145, um, and so there's delayed onset of symptoms, but it's more severe um, once they move out of the, the water moves out of the cells, so then they have that third spacing. They're going to have increased thirst and decreased output. They might have nausea, vomiting, and then also dry mucous membranes. So nursing care, so early detection and management of edema are essential. Also, accurate daily weight, vital signs, observing physical appearance, and noting changes in the urine output. Um, it's important for nurses to monitor clinical laboratory results and adjust fluids and foods that are offered to the child. And so nutritional deficiencies or failure to thrive. So failure to gain weight and often lose weight. Um, it can be caused by physical, so organic pathology, um, so organic failure to thrive, such as congenital heart or malabsorption syndrome, 
So with babies that have heart conditions, they burn more calories than what they take in, and so they start to lose weight. That's an example of a physical organic failure to thrive. Non-organic or NFTT is a form of lack of parent-infant interaction, which results in environmental factors of neglect. Um, so that's why we monitor closely with um, babies that are in the hospital and their moms, how they're interacting. And then also, uh, if they're pediatric patients, we monitor that as well, especially um, if weight is an issue. Um, it's really important for babies to be held while they're feeding and not have their bottles propped up while they're eating. So failure to thrive, it's often, these babies are often admitted to the hospital and they present with weight loss, irritability, disturbances of food intake, vomiting, diarrhea, and then also general neuromuscular spasticity sometimes accompanies with this particular condition. Um, so children tend to fall below that third percentile in weight and height on the standard growth charts. Um, so sometimes it can be related to a developmental delay, but it could be due to multiple factors and there may be a disturbance in that mother-child relationship. Um, so prevention of environmental failure to thrive consists chiefly on social measures. Um, pregnancy history sometimes reveals circumstances that may contribute to the lack of mother-infant bonding. Um, I don't know if um, it could be mental illness, it could be um, maybe the mother's not with the father anymore, or maybe that it could be related to incest, it could be related to rape, we don't really know, but you need to look um, behind what might be the contributing factors so that we can identify it and get the family help. Um, so impaired mother and child relationship, what happens here is the infant suffers from an inability to establish a sense of trust in that caregiver. So we're going back to that Erickson trust versus mistrust. Um, so coping abilities are affected by the lack of nurturing. So multidisciplinary approach in accordance with the circumstances. So we first have to identify what it is and then we can get a team involved to help. In some cases, a child is removed from the home environment and then it's placed somebody someplace else. Um, assigning the same nurse staff to care for the child may increase nurturing and interaction with the infant and the parent. Um, so uh, if feeding issues are related to that nurturing and we're trying to build up trust, we want to try to give the same caregiver to that infant so they can establish that um, so nurse is vital in supporting rather than in rejecting the mother. We don't ever want the mom to feel bad. Um, the mom needs help. And could, maybe it's related to postpartum depression, but we need to try to help them out. So you want to encourage the mother to assist with daily care of the child, and you want to point out developmental patterns and provide anticipatory guidance in that area. Um, so prognosis is uncertain. So um, emotional starvation, particularly in early years, can be psychologically traumatic, inadequacies in intelligence, language, and social behavior may have been documented in children who have failure to thrive. Uh, so quasha core, so severe deficiency of protein in the diet, despite the fact that the number of calories consumed may be nearly adequate. Um, so uh, again, they're eating enough calories, but they don't have enough protein. So this belongs in the class of disorders termed as a protein energy uh, malnutrition, uh, seen off, most often in third world countries. This occurs in children that are one to four years of age and have been weaned from the breast. So oral intake is deficient in protein. The child fails to grow normally. Muscles become weak and wasted. Edema of the abdomen, diarrhea, skin infections, irritability, anorexia, and vomiting may be present. So hair can thin, it's dry, and it may contain a white streak. And the child looks apathetic and weak. Um, so the white streak in the hair, um, that can be due to um, that they don't have enough protein, and protein is the basis 
of melanin, which gives uh, hair color. Again, this is due to that fluid shift because there's not enough protein in the blood to keep the fluid where it belongs. So treatment is mainly preventative. Simple protein powder sprinkled on culturally prepared meals will be an alternative. So usually we see this more in third world countries. So rickets, this is caused by a deficient amount of vitamin D. So exposure to sunshine is necessary for proper absorption and, and metabolism of calcium and phosphorus. Uh, so classic symptoms are bow leg, knock knees, beating of the ribs called rachitic rosary and improper formation of the teeth. So vitamin supplements along with exercise and exposure to outdoor sunlight is primarily the form of treatment. Um, scurvy, I always tease my kids and threaten them that if they don't eat their vegetables and fruit, they're gonna get scurvy and they're gonna look like the pirates from the Pirate of the Caribbean, right? Cause that's what usually happened with these uh, people that were sail sailors, they'd get scurvy cause they'd go out to sea for months and months and months and they would have these non-perishable foods. Well, fruits and vegetables are perishable, and so they'd end up getting things like scurvy. So it's caused by an insufficient fruit and vegetables that contain vitamin C. Vitamin supplements and dietary intakes such as citrus fruits and raw leafy vegetables. So symptoms include joint pain, bleeding gums, loose teeth, lack of energy, vitamin C easily destroyed by heat and exposure to air, uh, not stored in the body and daily intake of the vitamin is very necessary. Appendicitis this is the most common reason for emergency abdominal surgery. So the small appendage arises from the cecum. The lumen may become obstructed with fecal matter and with lymphoid tissue after a viral illness or with parasites, um, stasis or increased swelling, edema and growth in organisms. The initial pain usually is uh, periumbilical and it increases with a four hour period. So when inflammation spreads to the perineum, pain localizes in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. Appendix may become gangrenous or rupture and it can lead to peritonitis and septicemia. Um, so we don't really know what the main function is for the appendix, but we can live without it. I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because it's not very different than what you've learned in your med surge class. So characteristic symptoms. So tenderness in the right lower quadrant known as the McBurney's point. And they have guarding and they have rebound tenderness. So rebound tenderness is you push down, they don't feel any pain, but when you let go, they feel pain. So pain on lifting the thigh while in a supine position and pain in the right lower quadrant. So these could be signs of a potential appendicitis. Other things that we look for are elevated WBC. Um, they could do an abdominal sonogram to look for inflammation. They might have a fever. Um, if they've had severe pain and then all of a sudden they don't have pain any longer, we get very concerned because that usually means it ruptures. But it won't be relief for very long because then they end up getting peritonitis. So diagnostic can include blood tests, abdominal x-ray, CT scan, and ultrasound. So treatment generally is a surgical intervention that's typically required. So nursing care is the same as with most other abdominal surgery patients. Thrush, this is oral candidiasis. This is usually caused by a fungus called candida. Anorexia can be present because they don't want to eat because their mouth hurts. Uh, systemic symptoms are generally mild if the infection remains in the mouth and it can pass from the GI tract causing inflammation of the esophagus and the stomach. It responds well to local application of an antifungal suspension such as nystatin. So the medication should remain in contact with the patches as long as possible. So you can imagine with an infant, that could be very difficult to try to do. With proper care, the condition disappears within a few days after the onset. 
Um, so these white patches are painless, but they cannot be wiped away. Uh, worms. So uh, pinworms or enterobiasis. So this looks like white thread and it lives in the lower intestines, but it lays eggs outside the anus. The eggs become um, infective within hours and being of being deposited. The route of entry through the body is through the mouth. And so we do the scotch tape test. So basically we put scotch tape uh, over the anus of the child and then uh, they go to bed and then we pull the tape off and we look for the worms or the eggs. So anti-helmeth medications are given for both types of worm infestations. Um, so uh, round worms or ascariasis. This is seen in the U.S. southern states and among immigrants and migratory workers. It's caused by unsanitary disposal of human feces and also poor hygiene. Eggs can survive for weeks in the soil, and if a child eats soil, eggs develop into larvae in the intestines and they penetrate the intestine wall and enter the liver, and from there the worms circulate to the lungs and the heart. So people that have pica are more at risk for this. Uh, they might have a chronic cough without fever, and that's characteristics of this form of infestation. So parent teaching. So main nursing responsibilities is educating parents and child about the prevention of worm infestation through general hygiene, food handling, and preparation, as well as through environmental control. Poisoning. So the goal of treatment is to remove the poison, uh, prevent further absorption, Call poison control center and provide supportive care and seek medical nutrition. Um, so as nurses, we want to make sure that we educate parents, especially kids that are young that are at risk, um, to have the poison control number at hand. Um, so treatment will be contingent on the type of substance that is ingested, and there is information on page uh, 681 box 281 regarding the common medications and their antidotes. You guys want to go in, over and review those different medications and what their antidotes are. Like for example, you, what would we give to an infant or not an infant, but a toddler that ingested Tylenol? Um, so detecting the poison by specific odor and vomitus. We might not be able to figure out what the child takes took um, and so we want to um, be able to identify it by other factors like from the odor of the vomitus. If it smells sweet then it could be chloroform or acetone. If it smells bit like bitter almond it could be cyanide. If it smells like pear, chloral hydrate. If it smells like gar garlic, phosphorus arsenic. If it shows if it smells like shoe polish, nitrobenzene. If it smells like violet then it could be turpentine. Um, so general concepts is what are we going to collect? We want to know the amounts that they swallowed. Um, we want to know the principles of care, so we need to provide education. Also poison control centers, the national number is 1-800-222-1222. So we want to make sure parents have that up. Activated charcoal is given for some substances. So the issue with activated charcoal is it needs to be given within one hour of ingestion or generally it doesn't really do anything for them. Although sometimes when we get patients in the ER, even if it's past the hour, the doctors will try to give activated charcoal. So charcoal or any gastric lavage is not affected if it's administered one hour after injury. So poisonous plants, there's different types of plants that um, can be poisonous to um, children. And so we need to make sure we um, know what those are and how to treat those properly. Um, there's also selected over-the-counter drugs that can be deadly for, to for uh, toddlers. So benzocaine, which is Orogel, um, it can cause methemoglobinemia and seizures. Camphor, like Vicks, Vaporub, Camphophenic, has can have central nervous system depression or seizures. Diphenoxylate or low modal can cause CNS depression. Methyl salicylate. Um, or oil of winter, icy hot balm, arthritis, ointments can cause cardiovascular 
molecular collapse, tetrahydrolazine hydrochloride, um, these are visine eye drops or murine can cause tachycardia and seizures. So safety alert, many over-the-counter medications are considered harmless by parents, but can be deadly to the toddler or a small child. So we we'll make sure that we educate families to keep all medications, prescription or otherwise, which would include herbal supplements out of reach for children. Uh, poisons that are commonly encountered in pediatrics are acids, alkalines, medications, cyanide, ethanol, petroleum distillate, carbon monoxide, lead, um, arthropods, insect scenes, snakes, and poisonous plants. So lead poisoning or uh, plumb plumbism, plumbism can result when a child repeatedly ingests or absorbs substances that contain lead. Um, so the incident is higher in inner city tenants because pipes can be old and made of lead or old lead paint. Children who chew on windowsills and stairwells ingest flakes of the paint, putty, or crumbled plaster. And then eating non-food items like pica, people that have pica, it can have long-lasting effects on the CNS, especially the brain. Um, so me mental retardation occurs if severe cases of lead poisoning. It's one of the reasons why we screen for this early on to try to prevent so symptoms can occur gradually, so the lead settles in soft tissues and bones, and it's excreted in the urine. So the beginning stages and signs might be weakness, weight loss, anorexia, pallor, irritability, vomiting, abdominal pain, and constipation. And then later stages, uh, signs may be anemia and then also nervous system involvement. Um, so lead is toxic to the synthesis of heme. So remember heme is important because it helps to carry oxygen to the different parts or the different tissues in our body. Um, so heme is necessary for hemoglobin formation and renal tube functioning. So blood lead levels are primary, a primary screening test that we do for all kids. X-ray films of bones can show further lead deposits and then a history may reveal pica. Treatment is aimed at reducing the concentration of the, of the lead in the blood, so they use chelating agents. So chelating agents um, help to bind to the lead so that the body won't absorb it, um, and it renders it ineffective. So the prognosis depends on the extent of the lead poisoning. Uh, foreign bodies, so 80% of all ingestion occurs in children between six months and three years of age. So about 80% of the items ingested pass through the GI tract without difficulty. It may take up to six days to occur. And you want to caution parents not to use laxatives and to maintain a normal diet to avoid intestinal spasms. So if an object is small enough to pass through a standard cardboard roll or toilet paper, the children should not be allowed to play with it. So that concludes our lecture for today. Um, make sure you go back and you look at um, what do you do if somebody swallows a battery? What do you do if somebody swallows a magnet? Um, for example, batteries are corrosive, right? Or something that burns. So if you eat something that burns going down, are we going to want to induce vomiting? And those are some of the concepts behind uh, treatment for these. You have to understand the whole process and why we would do certain things. So make sure you study all of those. If you have any questions, go ahead and email me and reach out to me. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.